Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the Social Media, Race, and Community Knowledge Practices Conference. My name is Sherry Urban, and I'm a professor of philosophy here at OU and uh, one of the organizers. Dr. Kim, I'll let you introduce yourself. Well, my name is Jongnam Kim. I'm teaching at Gaylord, and I'm working on several projects with Sherry and Carlos. And I'm very happy to participate here as a part of a moderator team. <laughs> Um, if you all are just joining us, uh, you can find more information in the chat. We are in our final afternoon here, um, next to last session, but we certainly welcome you if you wish to um, share information about the conference uh, with folks who may be interested in this session or the next one to send them the conference website. Um, we invite you to engage on social media with the hashtag that you'll find in the chat. And um, we invite you at any time to enter questions in the Q&A um, or the chat um, as you as you prefer, and uh, because we will have a Q&A session here at the end of this session. Our next presenter is Dr. Jose Medina. Dr. Dr. Medina is Walter Dill Scott Professor of Philosophy at Northwestern University with affiliations in African American Studies, Gender and Sexuality Studies, and Spanish and Portuguese. His latest book, The Epistemology of Protest, Silencing, Epistemic Activism, and the Communicative Life of Resistance came out with Oxford University Press this year. He's going to speak to us about protest, silencing, and epistemic activism. Also, the comments will be offered by Lawrence Ware, and he's joined us as a moderator for several sessions already, and he's teaching assistant professor of philosophy and associate director of African studies at Oklahoma State University. And he also writes frequently about film and culture, I envy you for venues such as New York Times and the Slate and Huffington Post. And now we will turn it to Dr. Medina. Thank you so much. Let me start by thanking uh, Cherry and Carlos for the invitation and for organizing this wonderful conference. And um, I wanna thank everybody who has been involved in the organization. And let me share my screen. Let me see if this works before I start. Is it, does it look like it's working? Yes, okay. Uh, and can I move? Yes, okay, fine. So yes, uh, the presentation I'm gonna uh, offer you today draws from the book that Sherry mentions, and it will touch on how protesting voices are silenced in many different ways and how we can resist those silences. And that's where my proposal about epistemic activism comes in that forms of communicative resistance, epistemic resistance, are crucial for liberation movements when oppressed groups try to protest. Uh, and they need that kind of epistemic activism as a crucial part of the liberation struggles. Uh, and I will present in things that are part of the book, but I'm actually also including new material and new thoughts because I'm working now on prefigurative politics, how liberation movements prefigure new societies, different kinds of society. Uh, so that will be also the focus of my talk uh, today. I'm going to divide the talk in three different parts. The first part, and I'll try to be brief and go fast so that I cover all of this, uh, is just a brief summary of my own account of protest as a mechanism of self-empowerment and group formation. Because the standard view in political philosophy and in political theory, in political science, is that protest is mostly a mechanism for uh, public persuasion. That's what protest is. And I disagree with that. Of course, protests can persuade uh, the general public and the institutions and protests can be used in all kinds of ways. But fundamentally, the most important thing is that protesting has to do with forming a counter public. So even our, the first talk that we had at the very beginning of the day yesterday by Dr. Steele, also had an account of that, the formation of counter publics, uh, counter communities of resistance, as I'm gonna call them. Uh, and that's actually the core of my account. Then in the second section, I'll talk about specific ways in which protesting voices are silenced so that you can see, and I'm not gonna cover all of them, I'm gonna focus on two of the different kinds of silencing that I go over in the book, uh, but so that you can see the magnitude of the problem and, and, and the, the diversity of uh, ways in which uh, uh, silencing has to be resisted. And then that will lead into epistemic activism, the resistance of the social silencing, the social invisibilization of protesting voices and how that works in liberation movements and communities of resistance. 
how the creation of a counterculture is crucial and the cultivation of a persistent imagination is crucial for that. And then finally, the stuff on prefiguration that I was already alluding to uh, that has to do with how social movements can anticipate with their performance uh, a social change. So the first part, what kind of thing is protest? What kind of communicative mechanism it is? And what I want to emphasize, and this is a huge part of my motivation from the beginning when I started working on protest more than 10 years ago, there is this very naive idea that, well, protest is something that everybody can do in a liberal democracy because we have freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, and it's something that people cannot do in non-liberal democracies, which is not only empirically inadequate, because, of course, in dictatorships, non-democratic governments, people protest all the time in all kinds of ways, but it's also inaccurate and problematic because it's not true that just because you live in a liberal democracy and you have the formal uh, freedoms of assembly and, uh, and expression, you can just simply protest. It's up to you uh, and others like you if, if you wanna just take to the streets and protest. Well, actually that is not true. There are all kinds of ways, formal and informal ways, in which people cannot gather, people cannot protest. And moreover, even when they try, they are not heard. They are not found credible. They are discredited. They are not given uptake. And all these things, right, the roadblocks to the act of protest to begin with, the ways in which even when protest happens, it is discredited, it is not given uptake. All of these has, are very important ways in which a protest is being silenced. So the first crucial thing is to give an account of how to overcome those well-entrenched social silences and those forms of social invisibility and inaudibility. And there you have the communicative and epistemic obstacles that I wanna focus on. They include what we call today in the literature epistemic injustices that have to do with people giving testimony and not being believed, people trying to speak in public and not being heard at all, or being found nonsensical or not making any sense, just making noise. So all of that is crucial. And then the second part is that it is also naive to think that groups are there already just waiting uh, to speak if they so choose, but they are already there fully formed. And of course, part of protest movements is creating a public, creating a counter public as Dr. Steele was also uh, uh, addressing yesterday, right? So it is about social mobilization. It is about the creation of a community, the creation of a public. Uh, so that's a crucial component of every liberatory movement that you can think of in the last two or three centuries, probably going even beyond the, uh, that time period. But my focus has been in the book and, and in my current and ongoing work on anti-racist social movements from abolitionism to the present, and also queer movements, especially from the 1960s on, but also I've written on the women's movements and other movements as well. And in all those cases, part of the struggle is to become socially visible to begin with, to become audible, to develop a voice, uh, to have your perspective properly considered. So that actually is not something that the standard views in the literature uh, uh, give a, an account of or even address. So the formal view talks about just the formal freedoms of assembly and expression. The instrumental view talks about protesting as, a, as an instrument for public persuasion. And I claim that we have to go beyond that, that we need a non-formal view that looks at actual material practices of resistance and how they go through a difficult struggle in order to protest at all, in order to be able to protest at all. And also I take issue with the instrumental view and claim that we need a non-instrumental view in which we look at the intrinsic value of protesting. So it's not just about whether or not you're gonna be successful in persuading the public and persuading the institutions. It is whether or not it is worth protesting, worth taking a stance, worth engaging in protest because you want to create a community an alternative community, a community of dissent, a counter community, and you want to cultivate that community. Even what Du Bois said uh, against uh, Booker T. Washington, saying that protesting is actually necessary. It's not only not self-demeaning, because we're not pleading and asking for anything. It's actually necessary for dignity, and it, it's something that we do for our own sake. Even the Du Boisian remarks on protests are crucial for me, 
because that's exactly what I want to get at, that there is an intrinsic value in protesting, in engaging in protest for the group that becomes the protesting public, the counter public. Uh, so I actually focus on a performative view of protest that focuses on the very performance of protest and the intrinsic value that the performance has and how that act of protesting can be self-empowering for the people engaged in protest and community constituting so that it becomes part of the creation, development, constitution, uh, preservation of the community. So that is for me the primary function of protest, right? creating and sustaining communities of resistance. Uh, and it involves all kinds of things, but in particular, the constitution of the community of resistance, the group constitution, but also the prefiguration of other publics, right? So the creation of a sensibility that is typically not out there from the beginning. People are not ready to hear the protesting voices. They are not even equipped uh, to hear the protesting voices and give uptake. So part of the, the act of protest and sustain protest, protest uh, actions is create, creating that, sens that sensibility. So I describe protest as always being in search of an audience and creating that audience that does it either by transforming the contemporary audiences or by looking into the future and hoping that with their work, future generations or future configurations of the present people uh, will actually be different and will be part of the sensibility uh, that can respond to the protest. So it is about transforming sensibilities and transforming the political imagination in a complex way. So all those things are crucial. And of course, epistemic activism in fighting against silencing and in fighting against communicative and epistemic obstacles will actually contribute to all of this, as we will see, I hope. So it is about cultivating resistant subjectivities through protesting actions, uh, protesting practices. It is about cultivating a counter imagination so that we imagine the social world differently. Even what uh, Mariana Ortega was telling us about broadening perception, what you see, right? Broadening your affective reactions so that you are able to feel things that you were not able to feel before. But what is crucial is that I'm claiming that protest is transformative because that is a shift and that actually emerges from the acts of protest. It's not that there is already a fully formed uh, counter public that has all these emotions and all these capacities and this resistance subjectivity, and then they decide to speak up. It's that in cultivating a pro protest and protesting practices, those forms of subjectivity, those new sensibilities, those counter imaginations emerge. And I wanna give us an example, and I have many more, but uh, for the sake of uh, uh, time, I'm, I'm gonna go fast. I'm, I'm just gonna use an, one example, which is visibility actions that happen, for example, in the queer movement that happen with queer nation. And one of the visibility actions was staging uh, key scenes, what was, what, what was called a key scene. So that same sex couples would come out and they would kiss in public, uh, and that happened a lot. It actually started to happen in the 80s. And even before that, there are some uh, uh, key scenes already, but it happened even more uh, frequently in the 90s with Queer Nation. So you have here an image in San Francisco from the 1980s. Uh, and you can see, and I like this image in particular, I have many more like this. You can see that the activists kissing in public uh, are pretty diverse, racially diverse, uh, gender diversity also is represented. There are indications of class diversity and all of that is great. So you have this very diverse uh, group of activists getting together, right? And staging this key scene in which this is part of what is going on. They feel safe because they are doing it in numbers, uh, kissing in public, while at the same time, of course, they were being harassed uh, uh, when they had any kind of display of affection uh, or any kind of expression of their sexuality, now they felt safe. They also felt proud. They could feel proud in public about their sexuality. They were not going to hide it anymore. And all of this was happening, of course, in the formation of these queer groups, but also in the very acts like this visibility action that they staged so that they could do, could do it. And they could 
realized they could actually instantiate, if only in a corner in San Francisco, if only for a moment, a, a world, a kind of social world that was a little bit different, a world in which they could kiss in public and be safe and feel proud. And at least for a moment, not feel harassed, or even if they did feel harassed by the people around them, they could protect each other, right? And there was like a moment of a queer community, a queer world, like in that corner at the time. And that happened in many cities uh, in, in North America, not only in the US, but also like in the image in Toronto. Notice the Toronto image you have in front of you is not as diverse, it's only men <clears throat> and only white men. Uh, we can come back to issues of this kind uh, 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 later in the Q&A, but I don't have time to go over that. But that's just part of what I want you to pay attention to. Uh, there are many kinds of protests, of course, visibility actions are just one kind, but it changes visual communication. It changes visual dynamics. It changes what is visible and invisible. Uh, and of course, even though I'm not dealing with social media in this talk, even though I do in the book, the epistemology of protest, of course, the images that come out of these visibility actions, like these photographs, are part of the legacy of the protest and are part of the visual intervention, right? Um, and now we have social media, of course, that amplifies that. Okay, let me go to the second, uh, and I'll try to go faster, uh, to the second part of the talk in which I wanna talk a little bit about the different kinds in which protest is silenced. And I actually have a full catalog of different kinds of silencing that I'm not gonna go over because I don't have time. I'm gonna focus only on the first two types of silencing pre-locutionary silencing, which happens before the locution, before the speech act, what does that mean? It means that it's a preemptive kind of silencing. So people are being silenced even before they try to protest. What does that mean? It means there is a climate, there is an atmosphere, there is a culture that makes sure that certain voices don't even try to protest. And then I'm gonna focus also on the second type, elocutionary silencing, which happens when the speech act is there, when a, an act of protest has taken place, but did the force of that act, the performative uh, force of that act is undermined, is reversed so that uh, the, the act of protesting is silenced as well. And there are other kinds that I'm not gonna go into, including locutionary silencing. Uh, and uh, yeah, the second talk uh, today, but Dr. Blavin talking about the response, all lives matters to black lives matters is actually one of the, primary examples of locutionary silence. And we can come back to any of these types and I'm not even gonna say anything right now about perlocutionary silence just for the sake of time. But let me just highlight that silencing begins uh, in a preemptive way, even before the act of protest gets off the ground uh, with explicit prohibitions, but also with intimidating, threatening inhibitory, inhibitory communicative climates. And that happens in many ways. Sometimes it happens in very subtle ways. Uh, so for example, stigmatizing the group. Uh, so the ways in which queer people were stigmatized for centuries, right? So that they should be ashamed of who they were. They should be in the closet. They should not speak up. Uh, it happens also in more explicit and obvious ways, including here in this example in Ferguson, but also there are very similar images that I have also from the 1960s in which this happened exactly in the same way that during the day there was this disproportionate display of police force and, and military force, right? Uh, to, uh, because demonstrations or protests had taken place previously and they were likely to take place again. And they wanna make sure that people were intimidated. People didn't feel safe on the streets uh, and people felt like if you protest or if you try to protest, it's gonna be perceived as uh, a, a riot and it's going to be perceived as an act of disturbing the peace and we are already you know so this kind of thing is already preemptive silencing and pre-locutionary silencing but then of course elocutionary silencing is more interesting because it happens even when people are protesting and notice sometimes their protesting voices are undermined and their elocutionary force of, of their act is nullified to the point that they are not even perceived as protesting at all. They are perceived as rioting, for example, and looting. Even if there is some violence in the midst, 
that eclipses completely uh, what people are doing when they start a protest. And there are many famous examples of that, including the Rodney King uh, uprising, the LA uprising in 1992, more recently, the Ferguson protest in, in 2016. And in these cases, uh, we have clear examples of that before the protest is, is starts. Uh, uh, the institutions already warning people that they shouldn't protest. Uh, if the police officers in the Rodney King case uh, were to be exonerated, they shouldn't take to the streets. And then even when they did saying, well, if you are on the streets, uh, you should go back home uh, because uh, you know, you're know you probably uh, threatening public safety and uh, social peace and so on and so forth. And of course, there is a famous tweet uh, by the then president, Donald Trump saying, these facts are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd uh, uh, and I'm not gonna allow that to happen. They are facts. Uh, and when the looting starts, the shooting starts, right? And I have already published previously uh, to this in the late 19, uh, in the late uh, 2010s, precisely an account of that phrase, when the looting starts, the shooting starts, right? So we can go back to that, but that's a clear case of illocutionary silencing. And what happens here is that the voices are uh, uh, the protesting voices are uh, completely eliminated so that there is a case of disabling the elocutionary force of the act of creating an elocutionary flipping so that you're trying to do something protesting and then it flips into intimidating insulting others or rioting uh, and you have here for example a way of thinking about this, which is under the category of discursive injustice. Uh, and Quill Kukla says discursive injustice, and I'm claiming this is an instance of that occurs, when members of a disadvantaged group face a systematic inability to produce a specific kinds of a speech act that they are entitled to perform, like protesting, refusing. And in particular, when those attempts result in their actually producing different kinds of a speech act that further compromises social position and agency. So in this case, people of color, uh, brown and black people, they try to protest, which is a speech act they're entitled to do. But very often when they do so, right, they end up being perceived as doing something else entirely, not the speech act of protesting, but the speech act of threatening, intimidating, uh, and even rioting and looting. Uh, okay, hold on. So I want you to, 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 to at least get this part of the analysis, given that I don't have time to go over all the details that, and I'm focusing on pre-locutionary silencing and locutionary silencing, that here you have two different kinds of silencing. The first kind that happens before the attempt to protest, the pre-locutionary silencing, I claim is an ontological kind of silencing, a silencing with ontological consequences, which has to do with being impossible for a group to form, uh, to get together, to be articulated, to develop. So making sure that a group doesn't even exist, that a counter public is not formed or is blocked. And that I call group murder, communicative group murder. It, the second kind of locutionary silencing in which people do uh, uh, protest, they do gather and they do engage in protest, but they are not heard at all as protesting. There is an agential kind of silence. Their own communicative agency is taken away from them, uh, is robbed, is distorted, is co-opted. Uh, and that I call communicative ki kidnapping. So that you're there and you have agency, but your agency is taken from you in a way you're kidnapped from the public sphere. Your visibility as a protester is taken from you. Um, okay. So there are all these things going on. Uh, and there are all different kinds of defective uptake and recognition failures that happen. Uh, there are ways of blocking people's expressive agency, ways of disrespecting their agency, uh, displaying insensitivity with respect to their voices and meanings. And there is what I call expressive close-mindedness. So this kind of inability, uh, but also unwillingness to uh, here to engage with protesting voices. This, this is what I call expressive close-mindedness, which is a big part of my account. And it involves all kinds of things, but especially the three things that I have there, 
being inattentive, not paying attention, being insensitive to protesting voices, to pro protest movements like Black Lives Matter, uh, also refusing to engage, even if you are minimally aware and pay some attention, but you don't engage. But also it has to do with the terms of the engagement, refusing uh, to take uh, slogans like Black Lives Matter uh, in their own terms and in their self-interpretation of the people who uh, uh, give these uh, slogans, refusing to make a space for new meanings. Uh, uh, like for example, now, uh, uh, gender pronouns uh, and expressions like mispronouning uh, and you know, transphobia. Uh, and of course, there are so many examples uh, before this decade about new meanings being blocked or people being unwilling to use them or new forms of expression or new styles or new communicative dynamics. So all of that has to do with expressive close-mindedness. And what epistemic activism does is precisely to fight against all of this to fight against a expressive close-mindedness, to fight against communicative inattention, to fight against communicative insensitivity, to fight against uh, uh, dynamics that refuse proper engagement, and to create new forms of engagement. So that's what I focus on. Epistemic activism is the kind of activism that tries to change the epistemic dynamics, the way in which people understand, imagine, see, the social world and, and, and the protesting voices within it. And I'm claiming that that's crucial for liberation movements. It has always been cru crucial. And it's a big part of creating and sustaining a community of resistance. There are some normative claims uh, that I'm interested in making. Uh, I don't have time, obviously, to go over this in detail or even to give a full argument. But I do have arguments for these claims. Um, some of those arguments are already in the book, The Epistemology of Protest. I'm also working on additional arguments because I do think that those of us who think ourselves as members of a free community, those of us who think of ourselves as members of a democratic society and culture, we do have the obligation not only to protest injustice, but also to help protesters to fight against the ways in which protest is silent. So we do have an obligation to resist the silencing of protest. And when we don't fulfill this obligation, when we're not active in fighting against the silencing of protest, either as individuals, as members of groups, or, or also as members of institutions like our universities, right? When individuals, public or institutions do not resist the silencing of protest in an active way, they are complicit. At the very least, they are passive bystanders that tolerate that silencing. But very often, actually, there are uh, uh, very clear ways in which people become active enablers uh, so that they contribute to the silencing of protests. They contribute to the inattention, to the lack of response, to the lack of engagement, or the dysfunctional engagement with a protest. And there are all these different ways of resisting protests that I categorize that have to do with the different ways in which protests are silenced. But I'm not going to go into that for the sake of time, I'm just gonna highlight some things about epistemic activism that have to do with those three things that you have there. It has to do with activating the radical imagination, a counter imagination, a way of calling into question, interrogating established ways of imagining the world, um, in, uh, providing alternative ways of looking at each other, looking at the social relations, looking at the, wo at the world. I'm prefiguring a different kind of society. That's why I'm so interested in prefigurative politics. And part of that is living counterfactually, living as if we were in a different world, even though we know we're not. We still live in a racist society. We still live in a homophobic society. We still live in a transphobic society. But of course, the courage, the, the, the transformative power of activism is precisely for those activists to say, we're going to live as if you know, we could live safely and proudly uh, and as if uh, we were uh, already in that kind of world that we want to achieve. We're going to realize a little bit of that world already with our protesting practices. So the radical imagination in action involves that, a departure from established ways of thinking and ways of talking, established meanings, established social hierarchies. So that's the negative part, but the positive part is 
it involves also a way of remaking the world and creating new walls, creating new relations, intimate relations, sexual relations, uh, creating new communities, new social spaces, new social dynamics, new presence and new futures. And that is what I call counter practices of resistance. Those res practices that do exactly that. Uh, and they involve uh, 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 putting the resistant imagination in action and they involve the performative anticipation, which is what I call prefiguration of a world that is different and that does not include the injustice in question. And of course, I turned in my recent work to prefigurative politics because I realized, I mean, I was aware of this literature, but I hadn't really used it uh, uh, a lot in my own work. But I realized, well, you know, there are all these neo Marxists that from the 70s have been talking about doing that, right? Not waiting for the revolution to happen, but actually developing uh, alternative practices and alternative communities in which. A, a new world, a different world, a counter world is created and, and, and displayed. And that, that this prefigurative politics involves disrupting the social world as it is, that's the negative part, uh, but also creating a new world and a new form of community building. So it has the negative part, the departure, but it has the other worldly orientation. And I'm particularly interested in this second part, right? The, that involves alternative world making, the development of new forms of sociality, the press, the idea of the present in the future that comes from the Afro-Caribbean uh, political theorist, C.L.R. James. Uh, and he talks about that the future is in the present as a form of prefiguration, prefiguring a new society, a performative anticipation, not a prediction at all. It's the outpost of a new society, he says. And that was taken up in queer theory by Jose Munoz, the author that Mariana Ortega was drawing from and talking about in her talk, um, he talks there, there are moments in queer practices in which you have outposts of a new society, outposts of a queer world. And I'm claiming that, that that happens exactly that way here in the example I gave you earlier, invisibility actions, visibility protest actions such as the kiss ins. It happened here as well, as I said, although in a more limited kind of way, and then I want to show you, yes, uh, to move to the conclusion just quickly, if I have one more minute, I know I'm running out of time. Uh, so yeah, I want to show you, uh, like in this image, that which is much later, is from the 90s, that I, here you have something that may look like, oh, an instance of the same thing, or even the success of the key scenes uh, before they started to disappear because it, they became more numerous more accepted. So this is in New York, this is in late 90s, but it's kind of problematic because this could be like a Calvin Klein ad, right? So it becomes very white, it becomes very middle class, it becomes very commercialized, it becomes part of uh, the commercialization, right? Of uh, queer life and the co-optation of the queer liberation agenda. So we can come back to that. But there are two aspects to resistant imaginations in actions, the oppositional aspects, the experimentalist as aspect. There are an, an entire literature in that that I engage with. I don't have time because I already ran out of time pretty much. I do have things to say about the notion of living counterfactually because I use it a little bit different than, than Asha Bandari, although I take it from her. But she claims, as you can see in the quote, that those actions of living as if the world were otherwise, living counterfactually, uh, uh, ultimately don't have ontological weight because that possible world doesn't exist. And I take issue with that because I think that that world doesn't fully exist in the sense that we still live in an oppressive society, but there is a little bit of that world that you are already enacting. And that world becomes shared and shareable by the people engaged in the counter community, in the counter public. And it becomes actualized at least a little bit. And there are examples of that in the, in the work of Sadia Hardman, what she calls beautiful experiments of living, right? These communities of resistance that live uh, underground, uh, but they live in a bit, very different way and according to different norms. And that creates a different kind of world, a different society. So that we're here in the realm of prefiguration. And that has ontological consequences, the creation of a counterculture, the creation of a new world, even though 
it is limited because not everybody is part of that world and there are still blockages for that world to flourish. But there are new ways of relating to each other and new ways of living that become possible. So I want to just connect, and this is my last slide, a reparative justice and prefigurative justice so that our protest movements and our protest actions are not only backward looking and reparative, doing reparative uh, work with respect to harms. I mean, we need that. We need the, the, the paradigm of reparative justice, but we need more than that as well. We need to look forward. We need to not only repair harm, uh, but create conditions under which those harms will not be possible anymore. Uh, prefigure new social walls, new social relations and new societies so that we combine reparative justice with prefigurative and transformative justice. And we create communities of resistance that protect each other and are engaged in the creation of alternative walls. And with that, I'll stop. So thank you and sorry for being over time. Well, so let me stop. Yeah, let me stop sharing. That was great. <laughs> So now we'll have a few minutes of commentary by Professor Ware, followed by discussion and some questions. Uh, this was a wonderful uh, presentation, a wonderful paper. Uh, I really enjoyed going back and forth with you via email and looking at your presentation, looking at your paper. Um, honestly, just on a personal level, I was really happy to see you use CLR James. Uh, he's a thinker who I really think um, has nearly not enough philosophical Kind of engagement. Uh, I've written about him in a number of different places, so I'm really happy that you use it. I particularly like your point of communicative uh, kidnapping. Um, I had a whole formal thing that I was going to do, but, but since the time, let's just kind of get like cut across the field here and get to this. So I know you thought about this in your, already, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak about it more broadly. As I was reading your paper, listening to your presentation, um, something happened in my thinking, and my mind went to two places. One was Charlottesville in 2017, when the white supremacists had their Unite the Right gathering, if you remember that, a very dark time, very difficult time. And during that weekend, they protested, to be sure, and uh, to their mind, they were, in their mind, repairing an injustice. Similarly, in 2021, on January the 6th, those individuals did not see themselves as white supremacists. Now, I would argue they're adjacent <laughs> to white supremacists, but they, they didn't see themselves as white supremacists, yet they engaged in protest to be sure, and they were in their mind attempting to repair an injustice. And so ultimately, I would like to hear your comment on that. Uh, how, do you, how do these examples adhere to what you presented and how do they diverge? I think that's a really interesting place to begin further is there a danger in those kinds of protests, the, the kind of protests that we saw in 2017 and the kind of protests that we saw on January the 6th in 2021? Do they um, do the exact things you mentioned, but for markedly less a markedly less free world? That's the first question. I'll let you answer that. And then if, if we don't have any more, I got more going on. But let me hear your, hear your question, get your response to that first. Yeah, thank you so much, Lawrence. I mean, that's obviously a very, very important question and a huge question. I do have a, a section in the book in which I, I, I talk precisely about that. It's a section on, on white rage. Uh, actually, there are two places in the book, the epistemology of protest, in which I address that. The first uh, place is uh, the remarks on white rage and the Unite the Right, uh, Charlottesville. Uh, and then the other one is precisely what you said, January 6th, right? And I have different things to say about that. One thing to say, and you are, you're absolutely right, some of the, the, the resources that we have and that, that we highlight for protesting, self-empowerment, creating alternative communities, uh, also saying that we, we, we have been excluded, we have been invisibilized, we have been abandoned, are taken up by these very conservative groups. So they become co-opted and used for entirely different purposes. And the issue of co-optation already came up a bunch of times during these two days, already yesterday, but also this morning with Dr. Richardson's uh, uh, talk and in the discussion. And, and that's exactly right. This is always open to co-optation and it is open to being used uh, by all kinds of groups. But there are important differences here, right? 
I talk from beginning to end in the book, but also in my presentation uh, about liberatory movements, inclusionary movements, democratic movements, right? Uh, other movements that are not about inclusion, they are not about including people, they are not about becoming more democratic, they are actually about imposing limits on democracy, uh, are actually not part of this story, right? Even if they want to hide themselves or cover themselves or pretend themselves to be part of this story, right? Notice one thing that happens, uh, that is obviously very interesting and, and it's very obvious to all of us here, right, in this workshop, but not to everybody, that it is precisely when it becomes hard for white supremacist groups to intimidate and terrorize others mm -hmm. with impunity, right, that then they started abusing the democratic mechanism of protest. And this is, right, the KKK started protesting in Skokie and many other places with a permit and mm. saying that, that that was a democratic protest and they should be allowed to do so. But actually they did pretty much the same thing they were doing before, right? They were still intimidating and terrorizing people, but now claiming that they were protesting, right? In my own account, that's an abuse of the democratic uh, communicative mechanism of protest because you are still doing what you were doing before you were protesting, right? You are intimidating others. Uh, you are stigmatizing people. You are inciting violence, but now you're claiming, you're turning that down, right? And using uh, everything uh, that we do when we protest so that it looks like a protest, so that it has to be accepted, so that it becomes normalized. So I do take issue with that. Uh, because it is a co-optation of democratic mechanisms. But then also, I mean, as you know, there are protests, including Unite the Right uh, protests in Charlottesville, saying Jews will not replace us, that are explicitly exclusionary. They are not trying to fight for more rights, for more inclusion, for more empowerment for people. They are literally trying to exclude people. Uh, to, uh, so for me, that creates an important difference. Even in the expression of political emotions, such as anger and rage, it is not the same, right? When Black Lives Matter protesters came out to the streets after the killing of Breonna Taylor or George Floyd, and they're angry and they're outraged and they express rage. That is not the same as white rage, right? And there are all kinds of differences, but one is also that you're right, Lawrence, they may claim that they are oppressed, they may feel like I feel uh, uh, silenced and I feel invisibilized and I feel excluded. But actually there is some kind of important confusion there because they may be excluded for class reasons, for all kinds of reasons. But it's obviously not true that when white males still have the majority of their resources economically, politically, uh, educationally, and when they are always represented in every walk of life, they really don't have a claim in saying we are marginalized or oppressed because they are still overrepresented and they still have uh, privileges over other people. So there are all kinds of things, right? There are ways in which white race is misplaced, confused, distorted, is manipulative, and there are all kinds of important differences. But I think you're right. This is a huge challenge for me, and I think for any account, really, of uh, protest as a liberatory mechanism. But I'll stop there because there is so much, yeah. Yeah, there's so much. Thank you so much. I think you did a wonderful job. I think there's other questions here, but thank you so much. You answered my question perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we do have a question in the, the Q&A. And the question is, what signs of prelocutionary silencing are you seeing with the transgender community today? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Uh, I mean, it's not that the silencing uh, of uh, the transgender community is something that is happening only now. It is actually that the silencing of the transgender community is now more visible and it's now more in the public eye and more people are aware of that silencing. But actually one of the things that I do in the book and I have done in some papers is to look precisely to uh, all the phenomena no? and, and all the interesting cases in which there was in-group silencing within queer activism, within the queer movement of trans folks. And that even though they were a huge part, right, 
of the queer liberation movement from the beginning. Uh, they were marginalized and they were silenced and they were erased. Uh, I mean, even a decade before Stonewall, a whole decade, ten, literally 10 years before Stonewall, right? The Copper Donut Riot in LA happened with mostly black, but also brown transgender folks uh, demonstrating and rioting. That almost became forgotten, invisibilized, marginalized, even in Stonewall, not, not every participant of uh, Stonewall, but, but numerous ones actually were trans people, mostly trans people of color, like Silvia Rivera and many others who I have studied. And, you know, Silvia Rivera and others were silenced. They were not even allowed to speak in the, a few years later commemorating the Stonewall uh, riots. So there you have ways in which the trans agenda, the trans concerns, the trans identities even became invisibilized even within the queer community, even within the queer uh, movement. And that's a form of in-group silencing. And then of course, there are all kinds of ways in which in recent years, and, and that may be changing and that's great, people even in liberal circles, like some colleges and universities, people have not been receptive to use new practices like pronoun practices. People have not been receptive to facilitate the students changing their names, uh, making sure and doing everything we can not to engage in dead naming and things like that. So that lack of sensitivity, that resistance uh, to hear new concerns, new voices, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the silencing of uh, trans voices, uh, which is still ongoing, but has obviously a long history both within the queer community and obviously in the mainstream society as well. So I hope that helps. And, oh, what part of that is pre, um, right. And there are ways in which if you don't allow people to present themselves as they are, uh, so that they emphasize their gender identity, their gender voices, their gender concerns. So you're telling them you cannot protest, right? Sylvia Rivera was not allowed to speak in some of the commemorations of uh, Stonewall. Even when she was allowed to speak, she was uh, uh, told not to say certain things. I mean, that is uh, pre-locutionary silencing, yeah. Dr. Eric Behrens Garcia has his hand raised. So please uh, answer, ask your question, Dr. Behrens Garcia. Um, yes, so uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. How are you doing? Nice good, to see good to you. see you, Jose. Um, so I love this this uh, this talk, and so my since we don't have much time, I, I'll get right to it. Um, I was wondering about what if you could say a little bit more about the the conditions you have to have when you have uptake of protest, and I'll say why I'm asking this. So you know, often you'll have so after the protests that followed George Floyd's murder, you had like this little bit of shift, according to many polls about in the term in the number of um, white Americans who thought the US government had done enough to remedy uh, racial injustice and the legacy of slavery. But then that number after a year went right back to where it was after uh, before the George Floyd murder. So that's kind of like a diachronic worry. And then there's a what I'll say, I'll call a, like a, a synchronic worry across time where often people will accept maybe some something that a protest uh, is pushing some some truth or some insight or some fact, but then they'll continue to believe all kinds of things, say about black people or about people of color, that are incompatible, or they'll act in ways that are like incompatible with some truth that they maybe have accepted. Um, mm -hmm. So people will act or or believe in ways this uh, that are in in conflict with this thing that they they take themselves to have taken from a protest so so that's that's kind of the, the motivating the question yeah thank you so much uh, eric yeah that's a great question so yes in the book in the full account uh, in the epistemology of protest i do lay out certain conditions uh, that have to do with some of the things that you mentioned so there has to be a particular kind of receptivity to begin with because if people are allowed to protest but people are not uh, open to hear the, the critique, the demand, uh, 
then nothing is going to happen. But then even if there is that kind of receptivity, and this goes more to the core of your question, I think, then there have to be some epistemic conditions that have to do with the ways in which knowledge flows. Because if there is misinformation being circulated all the time, even if you were heard, right? Even if people had the minimal receptivity to get your message, if they are gonna be bombarded with information that undermines your message so that they get the impression, oh yeah, there was a little bit of uh, racist policing going on or whatever. Uh, we thought a year ago that that was an issue that we needed uh, police reform, maybe even police abolition, but now I'm bombarded with all this information and I'm like, oh no, it's not that bad or I can't forget about it. Or So yes, so propaganda, misinformation, epistemic bubbles, right? Epistemic polarization, uh, so that people only hear, right? Uh, extreme positions and, and there is no possibility to go from one to the other. I mean, all those are conditions that undermine the possibility of proper uptake. So you're absolutely right. Proper uptake is incredibly difficult. And that's why I'm interested not only in the silencing that happens before the protest, what I'm calling pre-locutionary silencing, during the protest, Right as the protest takes place, uh, elocutionary silencing, the immediate reaction, but the proper uptake, right? The afterlife of a protest, the community life of a protest continues, sometimes not in the best ways. And that has to do exactly with the question that you're raising. What are the conditions of proper uptake so that they have to be sustained in a temporal trajectory? Because otherwise, if it is about a quick fix or giving some kind of response, the institutions know that very well, right? Even corporations in 2020, as we all know, Uber and other corporations were like, okay, we have to say something about Black Lives Matter, that we support Black Lives Matter. We just give this message, like we support Black Lives Matter and hope for the best that that's all we have to do, right? So that a year from now, people forget about it. And uh, we are claiming we support Black Lives Matter, but we're not willing to change anything about how we treat people of color, how we pay people of color. We're not, we're really not willing to do anything other than make this statement precisely because of what you're raising, Eric, that they know, right, uh, that the conditions of proper uptake are going to change and then they can uh, just withdraw from engaging altogether. Um, yeah, I, I have more to say, but if there are other questions, maybe I should stop here. But yeah, the perlocutionary, one part, let me just mention this. One part of the analysis that I didn't have time to go into, which is perlocutionary silencing, which has to do with perlocutionary frustration so that you cannot achieve the ends of the protest has to do precisely with this, right? Ways, ways in which people were saying, well, Black Lives Matter is great, but police abolition, prison abolition are not actionable things, we don't, we don't know what that is. We cannot imagine that. That doesn't even make sense. That's part of, in my view, perlocutionary silencing. Yeah, yeah. I hope that's enough for now. Um, I'm going, there's, we're really close to the end, but I wanna give Christiana a chance to ask her question. Hi, Jose. Um, I was um, wondering, I, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about um, the audience that protest is seeking, um, specifically in regard to like proper uptake. So it seems like because um, silencing occurs through many failures of uptake and recognition that maybe come from dominant or dominating epistemologies. Yeah. I'm wondering if or should protest seek an audience that maybe is inclined to give proper uptake or if since what protest is aiming for is some sort of prefigurative transformative change, is it necessarily seeking uptake from dominantly positioned knowers or like uh, a dominating epistemology? Is that where it's seeking uptake from? Fantastic. Thank you so much for, for the question, Christiana. And you are giving me a gift because that enables me to highlight probably the most important part of my account which is the radical pluralism of a uh, protest. So in my view, a protest is always polyphonic. In, it includes the diverse voices. Uh, and I have much more to say about that. But also, this goes to your question, a protest always has multiple audiences. So the pluralism goes in that direction as well. It's an address that is open to many, many audiences. And people have assumed in the standard literature that the primary audience is 
mainstream society, the dominant public, the institutions. And I say exactly the opposite, that the primary audience is always the in-group. There is always in-group communication, the protesting public itself. There are other audiences as well. And they, of course, that may include the uh, even dominantly situated publics and even the institutions, but it is always the case when you are talking about oppressed groups, mobilizing, protesting, that the primary audience is the group itself. It is about internal communication. And as you suggested, that becomes crucial for the issue of uptake and the conditions of proper uptake, but it becomes crucial also for prefigurative politics. Why? Because even under the worst conditions, when you know you are never gonna receive proper uptake from anybody other than people like you, that people are gonna demonize you even more, that they're not gonna hear anything you're saying, that your life is even gonna become more vulnerable and unsafe with respect to those people. Nonetheless, in all these liberation movements, people have mobilized and they have protested for their own sake. They knew they were not gonna be understood by others, but they thought, wait, other people of color will know, even if nobody else believes us, that this is going on and that we have to unite and we have to pay attention to this. In the queer movement, people knew, well, of course, dominant sensibilities are not gonna be more open to non-heterosexual identities, uh, but we need to do it for ourselves. We need to come together. We need to support ourselves. ACT UP, which is the organization I have studied the most, and I have written, uh, uh, on that uh, act, kind of activism, the uncivil resistance of ACT UP. ACT UP knew, look, we may not achieve much and we're, the people are gonna hate us, right? We still have to take to the streets and say, we are going to go down yelling and screaming and protecting each other and creating a different kind of community because we're not gonna be silent when we're dying by the hundreds and the thousands of, during the AIDS pandemic we are going to do something different. And then that's exactly what you said. Prefiguration is about creating as much as you can, a community, right? Other people may not even see it or understand it or being open to that community. And that community may not even last, right? Uh, for all kinds of reasons, because uh, mainstream society could make sure that it doesn't last, but it is worth creating that community for you, for your in-group so that you can enjoy it, even if it is a moment, even if it is a weekend, even if it is, you know, uh, for some time. Uh, and that becomes crucial in these liberation movements, the creation of these spaces, the prefiguration of a different world, maybe not just for everybody, because not everybody's ready to be interested in that world and investing in that world, but for us. And then maybe in the future, other audiences will be receptive. So that's the beginning of the answer, but that's a great question, Christiana. Well, um, thank you so much, uh, Jose, for that wonderful presentation and Professor Ware, Lawrence, for your comments. Um, we're going to take a short break. This is actually a great transition because what we have coming up next is our final uh, presentation by Dr. Jessica Marie Johnson. And she's going to be speaking on some themes that I think uh, pick up very nicely on some of what uh, Dr. Medina discussed in terms of prefiguration and radical imagination. Her talk is titled Race, Imagination, and Black Digital Practice on social media. So we will see you back shortly. <laughs> 